And for me, being outside, got it, recording in progress. For me, going outside and hearing the birds, it, it helps me feel connected to the world around me. It helps me feel connected because my yard, the yard that I live in, is also the yard for somebody else. I have all these little feathery creatures that are here. They're using the resources like I am. And, you know, they're like the descendants of the dinosaurs. Modern paleontologists, some of them think that these birds that we look at as birds and chickens and things like that, they literally are dinosaurs in the modern world. And I think that is really, really cool that we can share our space and have our hearts lifted by these creatures. And it's not just about being connected to our environments, it's also about doing some pretty hardcore science because we're here to do the program today. And this weekend, we have a really special event called the Great Backyard Bird Count. And this is one of the largest citizen science events in the entire world. And the observations that people like you and me make in our backyards can help scientists all over the world study the environment and how things are changing. Now, I know there are some birds that all of us know. I mean, this is an introductory bird class, but I bet you if I held up like a robin, you'd all be like, oh, Justin, that's, that's obviously a robin. But if you really wanna know your birds here in Michigan, you have about 200 to 300 species to learn. And then you're gonna know all of them. And some people are like, well, 200 or 300 species, that's a lot, that's kind of a daunting task. But I'm here today to tell you that you are genetically hardwired to identify birds. It's part of your heritage as a human being. And other than Marion's iPad, I'm pretty sure all of us in this program are human beings. And you know, as human beings, we don't have like the amazing eyesight of an eagle. We can't run as fast as a cheetah. And we don't have those awesome radar dish ears like a, uh, a white-tailed deer. But as human beings, we are some of the best pattern recognizers in the entire animal kingdom. Pattern recognition, that's a superpower that we have. And I'm here today to prove it to you because I have a quick pattern recognition challenge. Now, right here off my camera, I have an item that I'm gonna bring into the camera and you're only gonna have a fraction of a second to see it, so don't blink. And if you were here in person, I say, don't shout it out. Like if I show it to you and you know what it is, don't shout it out, because I don't want you to spoil it for everybody else. But since we're doing this by Zoom, if you know what it is, keep yourself muted, but shout it out. So if there's anybody else in the house with you, they'll be like, what the heck is going on? And they'll come over and then they can watch the program with you. So are you ready? Because here comes the challenge, the challenge to prove that you can identify your birds in Michigan. Now don't blink, I'm gonna count to three, I'm gonna bring in the camera and let's see if you know what it is. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, so anybody think they know what that is? Now, don't tell me what it was, but if you want to put something in the chat, tell me a detail that you saw, something you saw about that item that helps you know what it is. Because again, if we were doing this in person, I bet you somebody would raise their hand and they'd say, oh, 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 a color. I saw red, or I saw white, or I saw silver. Somebody else would say, well, I saw a size. It was like about this big. Somebody would say, might say, I saw a shape. It was kind of like round. And somebody would be like, oh, it was kind of like a can shape. Somebody else might say, I saw a pattern and somebody might say, I saw some words. And of course, you all know what I held up was a Coca-Cola can. And no matter what side of the room you were on, if you saw this side or this side or this side or this side, you'd all know that you saw a Coca-Cola can because Coca-Cola has paid a bazillion dollars. So you would see their cans a bazillion times because somewhere in your brain, whether you like it or not, you have a little file card that has all the details for a Coca-Cola can in it. And I could go in your backyard and take a cannon and shoot it right through your backyard faster than a sparrow could fly. And you'd all look out the window and be like, oh, yeah, it's a Coca-Cola can because you know that pattern. And even if you have little parts of that pattern, you can identify that as a Coca-Cola can. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my coworker, William, and he's gonna tell us how we can use that pattern recognition as it applies to our backyard bird watching. So here's William. Thank you, Justin. So just like Justin said, uh, we are all hardwired to identify patterns. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the patterns that you can look for to help you identify birds. Just like a Coca-Cola can, the best way to get better at bird ID is to do it a lot. The more birds you can look at, the better you're going to be at identifying them. And you're going to be able to go from needing a field guide for that information 
to being able to, just like you have with a Coke can, have that information in the back of your head, in the back of your mind when you're looking at a bird. Another really good tip is in this modern era, take a picture of the birds you're seeing with where smartphone technology has gone and with cameras, uh, really good cameras being cheaper now, uh, you can get good photos of backyard birds pretty easily. And the great thing about a photo is it can't fly away from you. So you can take your time and use a resource like a field guide or a website to help you identify that photo. But let's say you don't have a camera nearby and you need to use just your brain and your eyes to identify a bird in front of you. I'm gonna tell you a couple of those patterns that Justin had mentioned, like color and shape and size that are the most useful looking at a bird specifically to help you tell what you're looking at. The first thing is be aware of where and when you are. Uh, if you look at a bird field guide, you'll see a photo of the bird and what it looks like. You'll also see a little map of the area that's called a range map. And that's really, really important information. If you are in Michigan in the middle of summer and you think you've identified an oriole in your, oriole in your backyard, that's pretty reasonable. But if you're in Michigan in the middle of winter and you think you're seeing an oriole, you might want to rethink that identification because they're probably all in South America that time of year. Or if you're in Michigan and you see an albatross at any time of the year, that's also something that you might want to go back and double check yourself. And if you do see an albatross here, please let me know because I think that would be a first and that'd be pretty amazing. Another thing you can look at uh, is color and pattern. Now color is a little bit tricky in birds. It's one of our favorite things about them is how bright some of them are but it can be misleading in some cases because color can change throughout the year, whether a bird's young or old, things like sunlight and lighting and weathering or even rain on a bird's feathers can change the appearance of its colors when you're looking at it. So what's sometimes more reliable is to look at the pattern of those colors. So not so much what colors you're seeing, but where a bird has stripes, where it has spots, what spots of the bird are darker or lighter. That's a really good thing to look for. Um, another really useful thing is the size and shape of a bird. So whether it looks pudgy or stretched out, uh, that's usually related to the length of its wings, whether it has a long or short tail. And a really important one is the size and shape of a bird's beak. And what's a really good thing you can do for identifying birds is if you're able to use that size and shape, and once you get practice with more birds, you'll be better and better about doing this. If you can quickly look at a bird and say, oh, that's the shape of a sparrow, or, oh, that's the shape of a woodpecker. Instead of having 250 or 300 birds to look through, to sift through, to find your one bird, you can quickly go, oh, it's a sparrow. Look at that section of a book and you're down to 10 or 20 very, very quickly. And it's gonna be much easier on you. The last point I wanna bring up is don't make your eyes do all of the hard work. One of the other things we really love about birds, specifically in the spring, as a sign of spring, is their songs. They're one of the most vocal animals that we know, and a lot of them sing very beautiful songs. And just like birds have unique looks per species, each species also has unique sounds that it makes. And you can identify a bird by ear just as easily as you can by sight. So if you learn your bird calls really well, you might not even have to see a bird to identify it or you can look at a bird while it's singing and use all of that input together to help you come to a conclusion of what bird you're looking at. So those are just some pointers about what to look for specifically in terms of pattern recognition for birds. And those are things that I want you all to keep in the back of your mind as we go through the next section of the program. I'm gonna call Justin back in here and we're gonna go through some of the individual common species that you might see right here in your Southeast Michigan backyard. Thank you, William. So buckle up. We have 250 species to go through. No, I'm just joking. We are not going to go through that. But we have about 15 species that we're going to look at that are some of the most common birds that you'll see at your bird feeder or just in your backyard during the wintertime. And again, the neat thing about that pattern recognition is just like William said, once you start to learn one group, like let's say you're learning one sparrow, now you can take some of that information and you can apply it to a lot of the other birds you see, some of our other sparrows. So let's jump into our first bird here and I'm gonna do some screen sharing. Because here, I'm guessing everybody knows this bird. Because again, if I had you in person, I'd say, yeah, raise a hand if you recognize a black-capped chickadee. 
And here at Kensington Metro Park, the black capped chickadees are very close to our hearts because this is a bird that throughout the wintertime, they're year round residents. So the chickadees that you're gonna be seeing here in the wintertime are also some of the same chickadees that you see in the summertime. And here at Kensington Metro Park, they've learned that humans are a food source. So if you come out to our park and you put your hand out with some seed on it, there's a decent chance a chickadee is gonna land on your hand. But as far as identification, looking at this first thing is we notice the size. A chickadee is a really, really tiny bird. If you held it in your hand, it only weighs about as much as a nickel. You could shove three of them in an envelope and you can mail them for one stamp, but don't do that because the chickadees don't like it. And for the, I like the feel marks, the way its bodies looks, you can see it has that nice triangular black bib and it has that triangular black cap on its chest, on its head, I'm sorry. It's kind of a gunmetal gray on its wings and that kind of nice clean buff breast. I'm not seeing stripes, I'm not seeing spots. And again, it's a little tiny bird that even in the middle of a snowstorm like we might have tomorrow, the chickadees, a lot of times they're out there. And even when it's really horrible weather outside, sometimes I go outside and I can still hear that Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe of the chickadee. And again, that's one that I just lifts my heart. I think that's a really cool little bird. But here's our next bird. Because if you took that little chickadee and this next bird looks about the same size as a chickadee, but if you put it in like a little bucket of sass and mixed it all up, you get a titmouse because the tufted titmouse is a little bit larger than a chickadee. And the neat thing about it is it has a crest. If you see a bird with a crest, that little kind of mohawk thing sticking up on its head, there's only a few birds in Michigan that really have a crest and the tufted titmouse is one of them. And this tufted titmouse has this really beautiful, again, kind of that grayish body, a little bit of black right above the bill, the nice clean buff breast. And the one of the things I really love about titmice is they are looking at your yard. And again, they're kind of sassy. They're watching, they're looking what's going on. And if you have a neighborhood cat or a neighborhood dog or some neighborhood kids who like to sneak into your yard, the titmouse lets you know. For some reason, they really don't like it when there are things sneaking around and sneaking into your yard, especially again, like a cat or a predator. And when I'm outside and I hear the titmice going, I know that there's something lurking around. But again, just from an identification purpose, we see that little tiny bird with that little gray crest and that nice kind of grayish body. And we know we're looking at a tufted titmouse and they really come to bird feeders a lot. So you'll probably see them in your yard as well. Which brings us to one of my favorite winter birds, the dark-eyed junco. Again, if I could see you all, I'd have you raise your hand if you've ever seen a dark-eyed junco. Because to me, the juncos mark the onset of winter. Because who here has ever heard of snowbirds before? Those people that fly south to Florida and they spend the whole southern or the whole winter down where it's nice and warm. The juncos do the same thing. Because normally these juncos are living way up in the north, up in Canada, all the way up to the Arctic Circle. And it's really interesting because the idea of south, it's a direction, it's not a place. So for the juncos, we here in Michigan, we're the warm south. And usually around Halloween, I start keeping my eyes open. And when I see a little tiny bird, again, this bird's about the size of a junk or of a tip mouse, about the size of a chickadee, but I almost see them always on the ground. And it has that nice dark black across the head, the wings, the back, the tail. If it's a male, the head tends to be a little darker. If it's a female, it might be a little brownish, but you see that all that black and that nice white belly, and you see them going across the ground, you know, winter's coming because the juncos are here. And one of the really neat things is not only do they talk to each other with those little voices, but they flip their tail. And the outside feathers on their tail have a little bit of white. And when you see them together, sometimes they'll flip that white and you'll see the white and they're using it to communicate to each other. And especially when they flip away, you'll see that little white flash and it alerts the other juncos that, hey, something's going on. You might want to follow this guy. But again, for identification purposes, this is one where you're not going to see them on your bird feeder. They're going to be underneath it on the ground and you'll see that black upper part and that white lower part. And you know, you're looking at a dark eyed junco, one of our birds from the winter. And then once spring comes, those juncos are going to fly back north, north again, and we won't see them until next year. But that brings us to a bird that we will see in the summertime because this is an American goldfinch. In the wintertime, I know it's an American goldfinch because I'm still seeing some of the golden color on its throat. I'm still seeing some golden yellow on its head and a little bit on its back. 
But the thing I'm really looking at are its wings. Because if you see those wings, they're nice black wings with these white, what we call the bars, that clear stripe going across the wing. I see two white wing bars on that American goldfinch. Because in the summertime, this guy right here is going to molt and turn into this brilliantly golden bird. And in the summertime, though, we'll still see those wing bars. And one of the things I love the most about that American goldfinch is this is a bird that goes all the way across the U.S. So not only are they in the forests of the east, but they're also in the plains all the way out to California. And they live in a place where a lot of times when they're calling for a mate, when they're singing, they don't have a, like a tree to perch in. So if you see a little tiny bird up in the sky and it's flying like this, like this, you know, you're looking at a goldfinch. They have this undulating flight. And every time they swoop up, they're making this beautiful little call saying, hey, ladies, take a look at me. I'm a goldfinch. And in the winter, they get a little duller. They molt those brilliant gold feathers, but they still have a bit of that gold on their body. And they still have that black, those black or the white wing stripes on those black wings. And they will come to your bird feeder in the wintertime. So they're a really nice backyard bird to see. Which brings us to this guy. Because raise a hand if you don't need me to tell you what this bird is. If you've been out in your backyard and you hear, J, 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 because all of us pretty much know this is a blue jay. And it has another crest, kind of like the tufted tip mouse had that little crest. The blue jay has that really cool punk rock blue crest with the black that kind of wraps around its head. And on the back, on the wing feathers, you might not know the pattern, but you're like, oh yeah, there's a lot of blue. There's a lot of white. There's some black. And the cool thing is I have some bad news for you. The blue jay, um, it's not actually blue. Remember what William was telling you about how colors, the sunlight on a feather or the the shade on a feather affects what it looks like. If you actually take a blue jay feather and you hold it up and you cover up the light, you'll see it's kind of grayish. The blue on the blue jay is actually what we call a structural color. As the light passes through the feather, it refracts those little blue lights and they hit our eyes and we think they're blue, but they're actually kind of like a grayish color. But what I really like about blue jays is, well, some people don't like this about blue jays, but during this time of the year, they're very loud. They're going together. They're full of the J, 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 J. And then the summertime, the same thing. They're together and they're like, J, 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 J. And during the springtime, they get really, really quiet. And they start sneaking around. And it almost seems like all the blue jays have disappeared. And the reason they've done that is because blue jays, they're baby eaters. They are sneaking around in the springtime when all the birds are nesting and they're having eggs and they're having babies. And the blue jays are trying to find the other birds' nests so they can eat their babies and feed their babies to their babies, which is really, I guess, kind of gross when you think about it. But hey, it's the world of nature and that's how they survive. So some people don't like blue jays, but I always think they're really kind of neat because just they're brilliant colors. They're very brave birds and, uh, and they are sneaking around looking for babies to eat. So at that though, I'm going to have William come on to do our next species. And William will not eat your babies, I promise. Thank you for leaving me on baby eating, Justin. <laughs> yeah, so our next bird does not eat babies. It is the morning dove. Uh, this is a pretty easy bird to identify because it's got a really unique shape. It's got that big plump body with a very pointed tail and a relatively tiny head. And you're only going to see two birds in Michigan with that shape. It's this one and the rock pigeon, which is that very urban, if you're in a, a city or a, a developed town, you're seeing the pigeons flying around, those are all rock pigeons. And they come in a variety of colors, but you won't really ever see them in this kind of tan or olive green that the morning dove has. So it's got that same shape as a rock pigeon, but a very different color scheme. Uh, a morning dove is a pretty common backyard bird. Uh, they will come into bird feeders. They are kind of uh, they're not really good at landing on bird feeders, but they'll go on the ground below and eat the seeds that spill. And if you have a platform tray feeder, you can get morning doves into your yard. Uh, and an interesting thing about morning doves is when people hear the name morning dove, they think morning is in the start of the day. And they're often surprised to see how it is spelled here on the slide with a U. Uh, and that's because the sound of the morning dove, the cooing it makes, is kind of a sad, mournful sound. And that's what gave it its name. Our next bird is the house sparrow. 
the male is this one on the top here, and he's pretty easy to identify. He has a very distinctive brown and gray cap. And I'm going to advance slide just for a second here because in the warmer uh, months of the year in the summer, he grows a dark black bib as well, which is really distinctive. The female is a lot trickier because she's pretty drab and brown and doesn't have a lot of distinguishing marks to look at. But one thing about her that is distinctive, and I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind before the next bird we're going to talk about, is her front half. It's brown, but it's pretty much a plain uniform brown. There's not really a lot of patterning on it, which we're going to come back to. But I want to talk a little bit about the house sparrow first, um, because if you've ever had a bird that's kind of bothering you by nesting on your house or on other man-made materials, there's a very good chance it was this bird because they are very well adapted to living near people. It's another bird found commonly in urban areas. And what's really interesting is it's actually not naturally found in the United States. This is a European bird. But when European settlers came over to the United States, some of them decided that they kind of missed some of their birds from back home and they wanted to bring them with them. So one of the birds they brought was house sparrows and they released them here and they did very well so well that they spread all the way across the continent and they're found in most of our states, actually, if not all of our uh, continental United States here. Um, but what's very interesting is we have a lot of sparrows here. And as those uh, Europeans continue to move across the continent, they were finding little new little brown birds that looked similar to their other sparrows. So they started calling them all sparrows. And we realized much later when we had better science that all of our other sparrows are actually not that closely related to the house sparrow, even though they look similar. So depending on your viewpoint, the house sparrows either are one true sparrow here in the United States, uh, but when you're here and comparing it to all of our other sparrows, it's kind of the odd one out. Um, what it's actually more closely related to is the house finch. Uh, this is another common backyard feeder bird you can see here in Michigan. The male is pretty easy to identify He's got, he's mostly brown, but he's got that red on his head and chest, and that red is variable. So some house finches are almost half red, and some of them, like this one in this photo, uh, have less red, but they're always going to have some red on them. And the house finch is another good example of why color can be tricky in birds, because birds with red pigment, like house finches, can sometimes have genetic mutations where that, or if they just have a bad diet in a given year, uh, you'll often see house finches showing yellow instead of red feathers. So there's always some, every uh, spring and summer, there's a few confused birders posting photos online of, of yellow house finches. But if you look at those patterns instead of those colors, it's a pretty easy bird to identify. The female is a little bit trickier though, because she doesn't have that bright coloring on her head. She's also kind of like the female house sparrow, very drab and brown all along. But if you look at her front, remember that house Sparrow had a very plain drab brown front. The house finch is streaky. She has dark lines going down her chest. So that's a quick thing you can look for to tell these two birds apart at your feeders or in your backyard. Uh, our next bird is one of those uh, North American sparrows that I was talking about that's not actually at, that closely related to the house sparrow. It's a white throated sparrow. You can see very quickly how it got its name. It's got a bright white throat patch it also has three white stripes on its head and the side stripes have a yellow spot on them. Uh, this is a migratory species. So you mostly see them here uh, in our area of Michigan. They're most common in March and November during those, they're an early slash late migrant. They're a cold weather migrant. They're not really here in the summer. They're breeding further north, but you do sometimes see them sticking out the winter. So you might see them between November and March and a little bit later, but not so much in the warmer months. Uh, they're a ground feeding bird, kind of like the morning dove. You can see them on the ground or on a platform feeder. And a really interesting thing about the white-throated sparrow is there are actually two different color morphs. There's this one, which is the white striped form you can see in this photo. And there's another one called a tan striped, which still has that white throat patch, but those three stripes on the head are not bright white. They're more of a dull tan brownish color. And a lot of people reasonably, but incorrectly assume that the bright ones are the males and the dull ones are the females. But the truth is that both male and female sparrows can actually be either of the two color morphs. And what's really interesting is that female sparrows of either color morph prefer tan striped males. But the white striped males are more aggressive and dominant and have a tendency to chase away the tan striped males from optimal habitat. 
So what happens is because both forms have an advantage over the other, uh, they both tend to breed evenly. And so both forms are maintained in the population because there's kind of a balance between the white stripe and tan stripe, which is a really unique thing about this sparrow that you don't see in a lot of birds. Um, our next bird is the Northern Cardinal. I'm sure you're all familiar with this one. Uh, it's one of the brightest backyard birds, the most colorful backyard birds we get here in Michigan. I think one of the most beautiful natural sights you can see here is a bright male red Northern Cardinal in the snow in winter. And the female, which you can see her flying down there in the photo, is a little bit duller, but she's still kind of like a tufted titmouse. They both have that crest at the back of their head. And she also, just like the male, has that big, thick red bill. And that bill is really important to cardinals because that bill is a specialized tool for eating. So a lot of our Michigan birds here are primarily insect eaters in the summer. And then in the winter, if they stick around, they'll switch more to seeds and berries because that's the food that's available. And cardinals do still follow that pattern. They eat insects in the summer and seeds and berries in the winter, but they eat a lot more seeds and berries year round than other, um, a higher percentage of seeds and you can see that from their bill because that bill, that big thick bill is a tool designed for crushing seeds. So like a little chickadee has to do a lot of work to get to the inside of a seed. A cardinal can just take a seed that's bill and one bite just crush that and get to the nutritious insides of it. Another group of birds that has a specialized bill is our woodpeckers. This one on the screen right here is a downy woodpecker. And woodpeckers don't just have a specialized bill, they also have a specialized tongue, which is a really amazing adaptation that we don't usually get to see because it's hidden inside their mouth. But when a woodpecker is drilling on a tree, they're looking for insect burrows in that tree. And when they find one, they have a really long tongue with a hooked tip. And you can't, it's hard to see when you're watching one, but they'll take that long tongue and stick it into the tree and those hooks will grab the insect in there and pull it out. And other really cool thing that that long tongue does is when they're not using it to feed, that wraps, it's all the way around the back of the head and it acts like a seat belt for the skull. So when they're hammering their head against a tree, that's how they kind of avoid that concussion or brain damage is that, that long tongue actually helps to manage that stress. This woodpecker that I have up on the screen right here is our smallest one in Michigan. It's the downy. It's got kind of a black and white checkerboard pattern on its wings there. And it's got, for a woodpecker, a really short stubby beak. And you can tell if you're looking at a male or a female downy, because the male has a red spot on the back of his head and the female does not. Um, and this is a woodpecker that eats a lot of insects, but it will also commonly come into backyard feeders. You have to be a little bit careful when you're identifying a downy though, because there's another woodpecker that looks really, really close to it. So this woodpecker on the right side of this feeder is a female downy. And the one on the left is what's called a hairy woodpecker. And if you're just going based on color and pattern, these two birds look almost identical. It's pretty much impossible to tell them apart by color pattern unless you really, really know your birds. Um, but there are two ways to tell them apart. It's their size and their shape. If you look at them in the same photo like they are here, you'll notice that the hairy is noticeably larger. However, that's kind of a tricky thing to determine when you're looking at one bird by itself. It's hard to judge exactly how big or small it is. So the easier thing to look for with the downy and the hairy is how long their bill is, because the downy has that really short stubby bill for woodpecker, and the hairy woodpecker's bill is about twice as long. So if you see one of these birds with a really long bill, you know you're looking at a hairy. It's got that short stubby bill. It's probably a downy. One more woodpecker I want to talk about is the red-bellied. This woodpecker has kind of a black and white horizontal stripes pattern on its back and a red crown stripe going from the back of the head in this picture to all the way to the bill that tells you that this is a male red bellied. The female, that red stops in the middle of her head. So she has a gray forehead. And you can't see any red belly in this photo. Uh, it's not a bright obvious patch like that red on the head. It actually looks more like the bird kind of sat on a red berry and then stained its feathers. It's a barely there thing. Uh, so it's even though it's in the name, it's not really a good thing to use for identifying this bird. And you might look at it and think, well, why is that not called a red-headed woodpecker? Uh, and that's because we already have one here in Michigan. Uh, I know it's probably hard to see me right now because it's a small screen, but when we go back to full screen, there's one sitting there behind me. And the red-headed has a full red head. Everything from the neck up is bright red. So red-bellied might not be a great name for this bird, but the red-headed, the actual red-headed woodpecker is much more deserving of the name red-headed than this one, so that's why it got it. Uh, that's it for our woodpeckers. So I'm gonna send it back over to Justin for a few more birds.
Thank you, William. And that's also why nobody kisses woodpeckers because they have a pointy hard tongue. So that's no good. But this next bird here oftentimes gets mistaken for a woodpecker. And it's one of my favorites because this is a white breasted nuthatch. And you can tell it's a little white breasted because it has that nice clean white breast on its head. It almost has a cap that looks kind of like a chickadee. And honestly, when I'm outside with people here at Kensington, there are a lot of people on first glance, they're like, oh, look, it's a chickadee. But then you start looking at it and a chickadee is kind of like a little round upright bird, but the nuthatch it's kind of more of an elongated bird with a longer tail, a longer beak that looks kind of like the beak of a, a woodpecker. But the really neat thing about a nuthatch is it's learned how to kind of out woodpecker the woodpecker because woodpeckers, they go up a tree. And as they're going up a tree, they're looking and they're listening and they're drilling into the tree to find insects. And they're really good at finding insects. So the nuthatch actually is the only bird in Michigan that you're going to see going down a tree. Now, if a woodpecker tried to go down a tree, it would just fall on its face because it puts its two feet together and its tail helps it balance against the tree trunk when it's going up. But that doesn't work coming down. But if you look at this picture of the nuthatch, you'll see how its feet are kind of spread out. And it reminds me of a kid on a skateboard or, a, or somebody on a surfboard. And the way it's spreading those feet out is what allows it to go down the tree because that back foot holds and the front foot braces and it keeps it from falling and it can see the insects that are on the tree that those woodpeckers don't see when they're going up. So that nuthatch comes down the tree and finds the insects that it needs to eat. And nuthatches are also a bird that will frequently come to your feeder because they also love seeds and things like that. And they're just a cool little bird. Which brings us to the bird that we all know. And this is the American Robin. In England and the UK, they have their own Robin, but this is our Robin, the American Robin. And we all recognize that beautiful orangish reddish breast, little white on the under the tail and the dark all across the top. But the reason I have this for our intro to backyard birding wintertime class here is because a lot of people think, oh, the Robins, they, they migrate south for the winter. And when the Robins come back, that's what lets us know it's springtime. And if you've ever been prowling outside, especially if you have some swamps or some rivers or some lakes near your house, it might be January 1st and you're like, oh, I see a robin. That means spring's on its way. And well, the weird thing is the, the robins, they're here year round. They might not be your robin. They might not be the robin that was on your lawn in the summertime, but it might be a robin that came from a little bit farther now, farther north. And where we're at here in Michigan, this might be south for them and they're switching food. They're not eating the worms and the insects on your lawn. Instead, they're going into the wetland areas and they're finding berries. So even on the coldest day of winter, you can get out there and you can still see a robin. And the really neat thing about robins is I love how their back is really dark. Because if you see a bird and you see that its back is dark, either brown or black, you can make a pretty good guess that that's a bird that either lives on the ground or really near the ground. And a lot of our sparrows that like to nest in the shrubs by your house, they're these really dark birds. If you have a bird that's really bright all over, you know that's a bird that probably lives up in the trees because it doesn't need to have those dark colors to blend in with the ground like the robin does. But that brings us then to another bird here. And this I think is the true bird of springtime. Because if you're down at Lake Erie Metro Park, where I used to work, and it was Valentine's Day, you'd go outside and you'd listen. And you'd hear this really beautiful, Oakley, Oakley. And you'd know that the red-winged blackbirds were back. Where we live up here in the Highlands, Milford area, it's usually towards the end of the month, more like about February 28th. Actually, it's probably going to happen in the next week or two. You might go outside. And you might see this nice jet black bird that has red on its wings. And this one is a very aptly named red winged blackbird. And the male is the one with those nice colors because the males come back a little bit early. They stake out their little area, usually in a wetland, and they kind of pluff up those feathers and they show that red patch and they start singing and they're broadcasting for the females. And if you look at the female on the right side of the screen, she looks a lot like a sparrow. And I actually had a coworker once before that said, hey, look, there's a really big sparrow on the bird feeder. But again, this is where you see that streakiness that looks like a sparrow. But if you look at the shape and you look at the size, 
And you especially look at that nice bill where it's kind of robust towards the back, but it comes to that really fine point, which is a good bill for eating insects and some other things. You can see that our male and our female red-winged blackbird look almost identical other than the color. So when those blackbirds come back, and again, I'm expecting them to come back any day now, you know that spring is finally on the way. And that's 16 bird species we went through. That's 16 patterns you can hold in your mind. And if you know those 16 patterns, you're gonna know actually a lot of the birds that come to your bird feeder because in the winter time, these are the most common species that we see. And now I bet you can take that knowledge and you can either find an internet resource or you can find a good book or you can find an app on your cell phone like Merlin and you might be able to identify some birds because again, this weekend we have a very special event that now I'm gonna turn it back over to William to talk to you about the great backyard bird counts. Thank you, Justin. So just like he said, uh, we have an event this weekend and now that you have this new knowledge of how to identify some common bird species, this is something that you can participate in. So what the Great Backyard Bird Count is, is a global birding event put together by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Audubon. And the birding community from around the world all comes together for one weekend and everybody is out birding and reporting what they're seeing. And that data is used uh, from because it happens in February every year, we can look at that. Scientists can take that data and look at it from year to year and see how bird populations are changing over time, whether they're expanding or shrinking or moving north or east or south. And what's really, really great about the uh, backyard bird count is you don't have to be uh, a really experienced birder or someone with a degree in a biological science to participate. All you have to be able to do is identify at least one bird species and report it to the bird count and you're able to participate and that data will be used to learn more about the birds we have here in Michigan. So this is the Great Backyard Bird Count website here. It is uh, birdcount.org. Uh, I recommend you check it out if you're at all interested because I'm going to go over some of the highlights of it in the next few minutes here, but I will not be able to even scratch the surface of covering all of the amazing information that's there on that website. There's some really good links for your birding information for more about the count. Um, but one thing you're probably really wondering is how you can participate in this if it's something you're interested in. So the count is, as you can see on the screen here, this weekend from February 18th through 21st. Uh, the only requirements are, again, you have to identify at least one bird species, and they ask that you bird for at least 15 minutes. That can be 15 minutes of walking a trail somewhere. It can be 15 minutes of sitting still in one spot. Doesn't really matter. You can bird from anywhere. Um, and then once you have that data collected, uh, you need to report that data. There's two places you can do that. One is another website, uh, also an app called ebird.org. It's an excellent resource for birding uh, here in the state or anywhere really. Uh, ebird is one of the types that I use most often uh, when I go out birding. It's where I report birds throughout the year. And it's a really great website for finding what other people are seeing. So you can go on eBird and you can look at a map of Michigan and zoom in on your area on the Highland Milford area and see what people are seeing and posting nearby. Or if you wanna find a specific bird, like let's say you really wanted to see a peregrine falcon or something, you can search peregrine falcon on eBird, zoom in on that same map and see where people are seeing that bird specifically. But it's also a place where you can post your bird count data. The other place you can post that bird count data is the Merlin app on your phone. And the great thing about the Merlin app is in addition to being a place where you can post that data, it's also a portable field guide. So if you don't wanna be carrying, if you don't wanna buy a bird field guide, or if you have one, you don't wanna carry it around with you when you're out birding, you can just download the Merlin app on your phone and it's got all that information for you right there and you can just scroll through it. Both the eBird and Merlin apps are free, so there's no cost for either of them there. So that's another great bonus for those. If however, uh, this is maybe, this talk may be the first time you've really thought about identifying birds and you're not super confident in doing it yourselves, that's okay because there's a lot of group events that do the bird count. Uh, one great place to check is your local Audubon chapter. They usually organize hikes led by a very knowledgeable birder as a lead guide. Uh, they'll meet at a park and they'll walk around for a good chunk of the morning and see what kind of birds they can find and identify. Um, another place you can go is since you're all local, we are running a Great Backyard Bird Count here at the Kensington Metro Park this Sunday, February 20th. We're going to be out front of the building. We're going to be outside counting birds uh, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Obviously, you're not obligated to be here for 
any large chunk of that time. Uh, it's something that we're going to be doing throughout the day, but it's not a scheduled program like this one. So if you're in the area and you feel like stopping in, you can show up for two minutes, you can show up for two hours, something in between, just check in, say hi, and see what kind of birds we're seeing. I do understand that it is February and you might not want to go outside and bird. It's pretty cold out there. One of the great things about the Great Backyard Bird Count is right there in the name, backyard. This is something you can do without leaving home. If you have a window that views your yard, you might not even have to leave your house. You can do the Great Backyard Bird Count from indoors, sit inside with your warm clothes and your warm cup of coffee and watch some birds out your window. And a great way to get birds to come into your yard and be near your window is to feed those birds, to put up a feeding station to draw them in. And that's what we're gonna talk about for the last section of our program here. So I'm gonna turn things over to Justin one more time and he's gonna to talk to you about bird feeding. Thank you, William. Because again, if we were in person, I'd say, oh, raise a hand if you already have a bird feeder, because I'm guessing a lot of you probably have a bird feeder in your yard right now. Um, I know I have one at my house and uh, there's a lot of different kinds of bird feeders on the far right here. This is one of the great bird feeders for the winter time. It's called a suet feeder and suet's just a fancy word for fat. So it's basically a slab of fat that is full of different seeds and nuts and corn and things like that. These are outstanding because in the winter time, especially as the temperatures get really cold, the energy needs of our birds go way up. During the winter time, that chickadee might be eating about 150 seeds a day to keep its metabolism high enough to survive. And during when the weather goes below zero, that same chickadee might need to have 250 seeds to eat each day. So if you give a bird a really high calorie food source like suet, um, it's wonderful, but I would recommend that once the weather warms up, you take down any suet feeders you have, because again, they're made of fat and oil. And if it gets drippy when the weather gets warm, um, they can actually get on the bird's feathers and they can interrupt the, their, how their oils work and just be kind of messy. Um, the feeder that we have on the top left here, it's called a hopper feeder. And it's any kind of a feeder where you just dump a whole bunch of seed in. And there are all different kinds of hopper feeders you can have here. We have some beautiful titmice, because again, we can see their little crests and that gray gunmetal body. Um, and hopper feeders are good for all kinds of different birds. They can accommodate different kinds of seeds. Um, here at the Nature Center, we love to feed our, our birds uh, black oil sunflower seed because it's one of the most nutritious seeds. It has the highest fat and oil and protein content. Um, if you go to a hardware store or a bird store or a garden store, usually they also have different mixes. And a lot of those wild bird mixes are maybe a little less expensive because they have the black oil sunflower seed and mixed in with different things like millet and cracked corn. And there are definitely birds that I'll love to eat the millet and the cracked corn, but it's really interesting because you'll see for most of our winter birds, they'll actually pick through it and eat the sunflower seed first, because again, it's the most nutritious. So they're getting the most bang for the buck to keep their metabolisms up in the winter time. And then that feeder on the very bottom where you see Mr. Squirrel sitting in it, that's what's called a platform feeder. And platform feeders can actually be really neat because if you have a platform feeder down by the ground, you might have things like morning doves and juncos and those white-throated sparrows come onto that platform feeder because they usually won't go up to a high hopper feeder or a suet feeder. But then you might be attracting squirrels. And I know in my backyard, um, I used to feed, I think the squirrels more than the birds until I like kind of made some elaborate baffles that did kind of keep the squirrels at bay. But again, having the squirrels around is pretty neat too. So if you have some feeders in your yard, again, that's a neat way to attract those birds because like William said, to be part of the great backyard bird count, all you need to do is be counting the birds at least one time for at least 15 minutes and then recording your data either through eBird or through Merlin. And again, that website gives you all the details. They do ask though that you record what time you saw the birds. So if you're birding for 15 minutes from 10 to 10, 15, and then you bird again from 3 to 4 p.m. You want to just write down the list that you take and write down that time and record it. And if you're watching birds at your bird feeder, one of the big things to remember is to clean the bird feeder. It's really easy to put up a bird feeder and just keep dumping seed into it. And uh, over time, just like our food can grow germs and mold and things if we leave it out too long, a bird feeder that's not washed, it can be a place where birds can share diseases. 
So they do recommend that you wash your bird feeder usually every two weeks. Sometimes in the winter time when things are colder, you might not have to do it quite as much, but as soon as the temperatures warm up, if you wanna maintain a bird feeder and keep your birds healthy, it's good to take a 10% bleach solution Take your bird feeder down every two weeks, scrape off all the seed that's kind of clumped in there, soak that bird feeder in that 10% bleach solution, take it out, rinse it off, make sure it's completely dry before you add some seed to it, and then put that bird feeder back up and it'll be drawing those birds into your yard, which is a wonderful thing to see. And if you'd like, you can always come out to visit us here at the Kensington Metro Park Nature Center because one of the really unique things about Kensington Metro Park is going back oh, over 50 years into the, the 60s, um, people have been feeding the birds here at our park and they've learned that people are a food source, especially in the winter time. So if you come out and you bring just a little baggie of bird seed or you can purchase it in front of our nature center on a little, uh, little vending machine that takes quarters, and if you hold a little bit of that seed in your hand, you might be just like this picture here. You might have some chickadees and some titmice and some other birds like that come and land right in your hand and eat right out of your hand. And it's, it's really kind of a special thing to have these birds trust us that much that they're willing to come that close to us. Because I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. Because I want to thank you all so much for spending some time with William and myself to learn about your backyard birding to get some birding tips on these 16 species and to hopefully have some information that'll help you uh, do the great backyard bird count if that's something that you'd like to do this weekend. Because birds, they are a really neat part of our world. They're beautiful with their calls. They're beautiful with their feathers. I think they help us feel connected to the natural world. And for some people like my coworker, William, who is an outstanding birder, he travels all over the place and he's seen birds all over. And for birds to take people from place to place, going on an adventure to see a rare bird that you've never seen in a place you've never been, I think that's a really neat thing that birds add to our lives. And for somebody like me, who's a little less concerned about getting all the birds on my list, I love just being out there and seeing them because one thing to realize is when you're in your backyard and you're counting birds and you notice there's a robin there or there's a chickadee there or there's a woodpecker up on the tree right there, it's really easy to think of them as just a robin or a chickadee or a woodpecker. But the reality is they're, they're living in your yard. That's not just any robin. That's, that's like your robin. That's not just any woodpecker. That's, that's kind of your woodpecker. I mean, that woodpecker's yard might be bigger than yours but you're part of its territory. It, it lives in the same space. And when you go outside to go to your job or to go get the garbage or to go get the mail from the mailbox, that Robin probably knows your patterns and it knows your habits because you're its neighbor. So when you put up some seed for it, it's kind of like you're helping out a neighbor. When you see it and you're like, hey, Robin, how's it going? You know, you're, you're making a connection with your neighbor. And again, during this pandemic, I think we really need some human connection. And we also need some connection with things that are bigger than ourselves. So I hope after this presentation, you can go out and see those birds and you can be like, they share the world with us. They're part of our yard. They're part of our habitat. And we're all here together. And I think I really love the birds. And I'm really glad that you all came to join us. And we'd love to see you out of the Kensington Metro Park Nature Center sometime. And we hope you count some birds for the bird count. But at this point, William and I would like to open it up in case you have any birding questions. So if you're feeling really brave and you want to put your video up and just raise a hand, we'd be happy to call on you like that. Or if you want to just type some questions into the chat like that. But uh, we're here for the next little bit to answer any birding questions you might have.